Hello, I am Brandon McElroy. Um, it's a pleasure and humbling to be here, and uh, I thank uh, Professor Miguel Garces for uh, the invitation to speak. Um, and it's uh, always a, a great pleasure to be able to travel and to share science with others, things that get you excited. Uh, as he said, I am a, uh, a sedimentologist and geomorphologist, an earth scientist who's real, the things that get me excited in the morning are when you know, something is moving and it's dragging something else along with it. That's you know, the broadest way that I would put it. It doesn't really have to be just rivers, but rivers are way cool. And um, uh, I am on sabbatical, yay. <laughs> uh, so I haven't really looked at, at this stuff in a while. And um, uh, Miguel actually suggested the title to me. And I thought, ooh, that sounds like fun. I'll do that. So I hope I've ri risen to the occasion to, uh, to make this, this topic and title uh, as exciting as, as I think it can be. Um, another fun note is that uh, I was just promoted to full professor um, just a couple of months ago. So yay sabbatical and, and uh, the final promotion of my career. Um, but uh, yeah, so here in the picture behind me uh, uh, is, a, is a, a nice uh, outcrop record of uh, some channelized transport system. This one happens to be Cretaceous in age. And make sure I can move the uh, cursor here. This one's uh, from uh, a rock unit called the Ferris Formation um, in uh, central Wyoming. And you don't really have much scale here, but the vertical extent is something like 10 meters. It's a relatively big channel. Um, you know, maybe not too much smaller in its, uh, in its scale than the modern Ebro. Um, and uh, what, uh, what I like to focus on are questions about what processes are responsible for making this record and what were the environmental conditions at the time. The, uh, the, the fields of, of geomorphology and sedimentology meet and overlap with, well, less in the US, but more in, in, in Europe, physical geography and hydraulic engineering to answer these questions. So when I go to conferences that, that I share in great detail the mathematics behind answering these questions, there's equal numbers of all those fields represented. And, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's exciting as a, as a geologist, trained as a geologist, to go and think about the questions of, of modern rivers and put them into the context of these ancient records. And that's really, um, what I, what I do. I think there's all kinds of things, just in case uh, you don't get as excited about what I'm going to talk about as I do. There's, there's, a, there's a cheat sheet here for you of all the things that I think that we can quantify from the geologic record of past sediment transport systems. So the uh, slopes and depths and widths of channels uh, that made something like this record the uh, geometries and the dynamics of the forms that were inside them. Think of uh, bars or dunes, uh, deltas. The rates of aggradation, like how quickly did this thing fill up? Um, the amount of material that's moving through, so how much material was moving in or out of the picture there. Uh, the, the, the transport conditions at the time, those two go intimately together. And then maybe even in a bigger picture, we can get to things like the discharge of water. How much water was being transported? Uh, what was the drainage basin area like? Maybe even then we could say something about how much rainfall was there. Some of these things require more than, than just having the uh, the... the the physical record of sediment transport, but we're getting, we're getting close. And in addition with other fields, we're, we're absolutely uh, moving towards being able to quantify reasonably all those parameters. There's other basic science problems that addressing sediment transport systems allow us to get after. So here we ask the question, so what's Earth's surface response to rapid climate change? Uh, this is an interval uh, in uh, 
Western North America uh, through the Bighorn Basin of the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And here's a uh, uh, schematic uh, section uh, through there uh, with uh, some organic uh, uh, carbon um, delta 13C values uh, plotted along the way to identify the PETM, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And, you know, others have then used the channel bodies that are in here. So here's a whole bunch of mud, here's a whole bunch of mud, and there's a bunch of fluvial sands. Say, well, what was going on in the rivers at the time that we know to have a pretty dramatic change in the climate conditions? Uh, so that's a, that's a basic science question that we can address. Um, other basic science questions are being addressed on Mars. Uh, so how much did the Martian surface evolve? How much water was there? Here you can see a, an image from the uh, Curiosity rover exploring Gale Crater almost a decade ago. Uh, and here are some uh, uh, cross-stratified sands. And they're, they're within this uh, schematic section here. They were, they were out at the, at the edge of what was interpreted to be a, a, a suite of lake deposits. Um, and, you know, it's, it's through the application of the, the techniques of understanding ancient transport systems, broadly called paleohydraulics, that we can take this record and quantify how much water there was there. That's, that's what's going on. And we're also doing that in, like, the, the, with the Perseverance uh, uh, rover up in the Jezero crater. Um, so let me walk you through this idea of paleohydraulics. Uh, on the right here is a movie that's not playing. Maybe it is. Oh, look at that. On the left, my right, on the left. Okay, so here is a, a, a series of overhead photos taken of a delta growing in an experimental uh, setting, so a, an analog model of a, of a fan delta. And you can see little spurts of growth uh, at the shoreline. So there is some flow and sediment transport dynamics that are going on in this system. Ooh, it just abandoned all, the, all this front and, and got stuck along the wall there, it all floated. So that flow and in, in, in sediment transport dynamics yields some amount of change of this surface. So it gives rise to the kinematics of the sedimentary surface. And the sedimentary surface changes through time. And if uh, we took a slice from about here out into the water, this is what that slice would look like. And then here's the stratigraphic interpretation of that slice. So, so the flow and the sediment transport dynamics relate to the kinematics of the sedimentary surface, and that relates to the overall stratigraphic architecture created by the transport system that built the delta. So we think of this as the forward model, right? That there's this experiment going on that builds a, a surface and that ultimately makes a deposit. That's in the forward direction. That's how Earth does it. And what we want to do is be able to do the inverse and say, okay, I have a stratigraphic architecture that's preserved out in the world somewhere. I'd like to know what the sedimentary surface was doing at the time that this was preserved, and then ultimately be able to quantify the details of the flow and the sediment transport dynamics of the system that was, that was building all this. So, so this is the forward model, right? That's how the world really works. And we're interested in going in the inverse direction, and that's paleohydraulics. Uh, sometimes we have actual stratigraphic architecture, and sometimes we just have the kinematics of a sedimentary surface. And so this is uh, the sedimentologist version, and this is sort of just the geomorphologist version. So sometimes, like on Mars, there are channels that remain, and we already have a channel there. We know water was, or some other fluid was flowing through it, and we don't have to go from its record from a stratigraphic point of view, we have the, the form itself that was transporting material. And so we just, we just go from here that way. Anyways, they're all, they're all interrelated. 
let's, uh, let's, let's take a little dive into the behavior of rivers. Let's talk about the forward model for a little bit. I will demonstrate to you some additions that my group has made to our broader understanding of the forward model over the last decade, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do some inverse modeling fun. So this is um, a series of bathymetric images of the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. And <clears throat> there was a boat, and uh, this boat had mounted on it a, uh, an acoustic sensor, a sonar. And the sonar and the boat drove up and down, up and down. And it did this about every six minutes uh, for 13 hours a day for a number of days. Uh, and here is um, about uh, two gigabytes worth of data. It's, you know, thousands of measurements of the, uh, of the bed of the Colorado River changing through time. And uh, you, you'll see it jump. Like, it looks like there, there's pretty consistent motion. And then sometimes we stop for lunch and they move a little bit. And then sometimes they get a lot smaller or a lot bigger. And that's us going to sleep and waking up and doing it again the next day. Sometimes they let a little extra water out of the dam or something like this. But... But I just want to draw your, like, draw your attention to, to the dynamics that are going on in these bed forms here. So here's a series of dunes. There's bigger ones. There's littler ones. Sometimes you see the little ones move really fast. Sometimes they disappear altogether. Sometimes they get bigger and smaller. They merge. They split. They do all kinds of fantastic things. That, that yields some complications. Uh, in how we understand rivers to behave, but ultimately we break it down into a series of five scales here. So <clears throat> this figure uh, up top is a cross section. So we go back and if we just drew a line from left to right across here and we zoomed in on it, right, this is the, this is the, the topography. So on the uh, the vertical axis is, is elevation of the bed, and on the horizontal axis is position along the river. And <clears throat> if we did that in one spot over and over and over again through time, and then stacked those images up so that each row of pixels in this map is the equivalent of a cross section, and each step forward in time is another row of pixels. This is the map that we would make of the behavior. The hot colors are high, the cool colors are low, and so you can see the crests of bed forms here are expressed as this sort of slanted red, yellow. The troughs of bed forms are this slanted bluish green. The heights so basically the distance between the, the trough of a bed form and the crest. Uh, so here's the crest, the top, and here's the trough, the, the, the bottom right in front of it. And so that represents a height. And the length is essentially the distance between crest to crest of adjacent bed forms or trough to trough. You can get that also here. So the distance between the deep blue and the, and the darkest reds, like that's a height. The distance between this blue and that blue, that's trough and that's trough. That's, that's a length. Then there's velocity. And since the axes here are time against position, then the average slanting here represents the velocity, the migration rate at which the bed forms moved along. Sediment was being transported over them. There's deformation. So deformation means there's a mean velocity here. The whole field is moving through space with time, but there's changes that are occurring within that mean movement. And those changes are rather significant. They account for a substantial portion of the material that's being transported. So there's another scale of deformation. Basically, you see the trough gets wider and skinnier, and then it just seems to go away. So the, the merging and the splitting of new bed forms is, is all within deformation. And there's finally a flux, which is the, the total mass of material movement that's required uh, to, to make this map, essentially the integral under the curve through time. So these are all characteristics of how rivers behave. And this is only at the bed form scale. We haven't even moved up to bars or deltas. Uh, <coughs> 
the problem uh, is called the morphodynamics. And <clears throat> there are three essential pieces within a morphodynamic framework. And one of them is the topography. We represent it with the character eta. This is, what is what's the shape of the bed? <clears throat> and the topography influences the fluid flow over top of it, right? So there's a big mound, the fluid has to flow around it. There's a little mound, the fluid flows over it. But the topography is what generates resistance to flow. It also provides the gravitational gradient that the fluid flows over. So the topography gives rise to this, this fluid flow, and we characterize that in a fluvial system by saying that the stress that the that the bed applies to the fluid flow is related to the product of the, the depth and the slope. And these are constants for density and gravity here on Earth. But the, the, the depth and the, and the slope of, of the fluid flowing over the surface is related to the stresses that are there. And the fluid flow is what gives rise to the transport of sediment. There are many relations that, that do this, but they all take a form that's relatively similar to this, where the flux of material, this Q represents the flux, the mass per unit time of sediment transport, is related to the stresses that are applied, and they're non-linearly related to the stresses. So the, the fluid flow moves the sediment, and then the sediment in transport over top of the bed actually then modifies the bed through sediment mass conservation. So here is the difference equation that represents the change in sediment transport over some space is related to the time rate of change of elevation. So sediment mass conservation then takes the sediment transport field and modifies the, the topographic field. So the topography forces the fluid flow which moves the sediment, which updates the topography, right? It is a complex system. And <clears throat> what that means is that it is a system that is very highly sensitive to some boundary conditions and some initial conditions, and it's highly insensitive to others. So the ones that it's really sensitive to are probably not good candidates for us to understand in deep time. But the ones that it's relatively insensitive to, we can certainly make headway with. So this, this is the basic description of what you just saw in the movie, right, of the, all those bed forms uh, developing through time. But it also is the appropriate description for all sorts of scales of alluvial forms. Alluvial means a system that is transporting sediment and is building itself. The form that it, that it makes is built out of the sediment that's, that it's transporting. That's what alluvial means. And so all these alluvial forms that are in here are morphodynamic between uh, this axis here is the distance that a grain travels in a single travel event. And this is how big a landform is. So uh, dunes and bars and ripples and uh, deltas, these are all morphodynamic forms. They exist in a world where the grains move a distance that is small relative to the overall size so grains move into a bed form, but they don't go past the bed form. They move into a delta, but they don't go past the delta in a single transport event. And so those grains can participate in the topography forces, the fluid flow forces sediment transport, updates the topography. They can take part in that. For grains that travel very, very much further, like mud travels really far, it doesn't settle out of suspension very easily. And so mud really isn't part of a morphodynamic system like bed forms. Once it gets into a river and gets going, it just gets transported away. So there's, there's morphologies uh, 
that are that are too big to approach with this and so the dynamics of floodplains are, are really not something that we can address with this kind of technique uh, and similarly there are there are morphologies that are too small and that's through the the dynamics of of, of the communication within the fluid system so there are distances over which the fluid can uh, transmit information and there are distances that are too large for that transmission of information and for distances that are too large morphodynamics doesn't work there either essentially the fluid doesn't get updated uh, with information about what's happening further down through sediment transport okay so all this comes down to the the basic morphodynamic problem in alluvial rivers this forward model for thinking about how things work in an alluvial system. Here's a, just a, a real textbook, you know, classic example of what a river looks like. And there's some stuff in here that, yes, there's a bend and here's a point bar and it's building in that direction and the sides eroding, but it's all in sediment that it previously deposited. We call this alluvial. And the, the way that it works is that the river approximately fills its banks when it's doing the most important amount of work. So sometimes rivers flood and the water is all the way over the floodplain, but that doesn't happen very often. And sometimes the water is really low and it doesn't really move much sediment and that doesn't happen very often, or at least not often enough and, and it doesn't move much sediment. So it really doesn't help build all of the uh, strata that are here. But there is sort of a sweet spot where the river moves a lot of sediment and does it often enough that it's, it's, it's more or less singularly responsible for building the form and the shape that's there through this morphodynamic feedback. And uh, we call that bankful. So when, sort of a funny term I've always thought, uh, when when the river banks are just full of water, like right before it floods, we call it bankful, and that's when the river is doing the most important amount of work. And work here means geomorphic work, the transport of sediment. The most sediment is being transported just when the banks are full. And so what we can do in this morphodynamic problem is actually ask questions that are specifically focused on what happens at bankful and the reason is because it is the most important condition in building uh, the river so it turns out that the that rivers uh, are more or less organized so here's a plot that puts stress uh, and this is stress normalized to the weight of the grain so the definition is over here um, this tau is shield stress and it is the uh, it's a ratio of the driving forces so here's the depth of water at bankful and the slope of the river normalized to the grain size this is essentially the submerged specific weight of sediment that's sitting on the bed and <clears throat> the uh, the figure here so shows shield stress against grain size for a collection of modern rivers and at bankful this is this is the data set this is the cluster of 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 what happens in modern alluvial rivers so basically those rivers that are allowed to build the channel that they have that transports the sediment that they have to move uh, have a relationship between the stress that is required to move the sediment that is there and the grain size of that sediment so this relationship we can't predict it's completely empirical, but it's a really good one, and it solves the problem of us knowing that we need a, to, to, to get depth, slope, and grain size. Those are the three variables that are in here, but the, the grain size is related to the stress that's required to move material at bankful, and so we get another equation, that, that's this line, empirically, and so we've now reduced it to just two two things that are required, the, the, the flow depth and the slope in order to get the stress 
which then determines sediment transport and allows us to, to investigate all the parameters that I showed you on the, on the first or second slide. All right, so, so this is the actual way that we, we solve it. We don't, we don't leave it in this ugly mess to do it. But so here's the, here's the, the, the way that it's determined that we can uh, figure out what slope is as a function of, of flow depth and grain size. And here's the records that we use, right? So this one's actually not too far away. This one's outside of, of, of CASPE. And uh, here we are, we're looking at some uh, uh, bed form cross strata. Uh, here's a nice picture. This one happens to be from Utah. And they're looking at some bar form cross strata here. And uh, this is in uh, Western Ireland. Uh, the, the photos don't come out, so such good contrast for you, I don't think. Um, but here there's a channel body. And so what we need in order to understand the morphodynamics and the behavior of these alluvial rivers that left us some record here, what we need is two pieces of information that relate back to this problem of us being able to close the entire system of alluvial river behavior. And the two pieces of information that we need are the sizes of the sediment grains that were being moved and something about the depth, an approximation for the scale of the flow depth. And so, so this one's great. This is a, here, there's a channel body here. And so we can interpret directly the flow depth there. And here, this is a, a bar and here's some other bed forms. And so maybe through the investigation of those deposits, we can make some estimate of the flow depth and the grain size. And that's what we do. Okay, so grain size is relatively easy to do. You can either, you know, look at it with a, with a card and say, here's how big I think the grains are, or you can do something fancy, like take a sample home and get rid of all the cement in some way. If it's carbonate cement, it's relatively easy to digest the cement um, with some acid and then to uh, sieve the grains so that you don't have any mud and you put them through some kind of machine and you can get a nice grain size distribution. But the reality is that measuring the sizes of grains is very easy. There's not a lot of uncertainty. Like there's this, the, the models for how we understand the past don't depend on our ability to measure grain size. In an entirely separate uh, uh, talk, I would tell you that I'm pretty sure that we can do uh, all of paleohydraulics at 100 kilometers an hour. Like you drive down the road, you look at the channel, and you're like, yeah, it's sandy. Woohoo! You know, I know what the slope was. It was about 10 to the minus four. The depth was a meter. The flow was a meter a second. Woohoo! Keep on driving, right? Like that, it's possible, and it doesn't depend on our ability to get the grain sizes right. Grain size we can do very easily, no problem. Flow depths are a little bit harder but they're not really, really complicated. So here's, here's, a, here's a nice uh, preserved bar form. This black line represents a, a single uh, surface uh, it was, that was active in the transport system at one time. Here's uh, uh, Professor Paul Heller for scale, uh, uh, an informal mentor of mine at the University of Wyoming. And uh, the, the idea for a long time has been that, that, this, uh, that the vertical extent of this surface probably represented how deep the river was, so that's probably flow depth. Okay, we never really had any data sets to test that, though. There really haven't ever been very good data sets. There's, there's one small data set from a river in central uh, Nebraska of the U.S. that uh, is groundwater fed, and so the discharge never changes, and, but it's only like 10 centimeters deep. So it, Never felt like it was that, that good to rely on. Um, we, uh, we, uh, a previous PhD student took advantage of a flood in the Missouri River here. So there was so much water that they were worried the dams would fail. And so they let the maximum amount of water out of the dams for three months straight. And just below the dam, a whole bunch of bars were built in the Missouri River uh, over this three months of constant flooding. They were taking bathymetry like we did for the Colorado River during this time. And uh, after three months, the danger was gone. So they dropped the flow rather dramatically. Uh, it resulted in meters of water elevation drop in a, a very short period. And so they exposed a whole bunch of these bars. 
and we asked the question, okay, well, how big are the bars? We know how deep the flow was because they were taking measurements of the depth of the water during the time. And so we measured thousands of, of, of bar fronts from hundreds of individual bars. And um, uh, this is the distribution of the height of the bars to the actual mean depth of the river in the area. And it's a complicated distribution, I'll grant you, but the, uh, the, the, the peak is up here around something like the depth of flow is like three times the bar height. Um, so this is the first sort of really extensive uh, data set about that. And the reason is because it's hard to get rivers to have the same discharge for a long time, right? If discharge constantly varying, how do you know which part of the, of, of the behavior is related to the most recent conditions as opposed to the conditions before that? And so when the conditions are constant like this, you get a really good opportunity to test the hypothesis about the relationship between flow depth and bar height. Okay, so, so grain size, good, bar height, good, and slope, right? We, we, can, we, can, we can relate because we have this. And so that's it. Like, that's all we need. We have enough information. Now we can, we can tackle all the other problems. We can, we can go after sediment transport, you know, any, any other number of, of possibilities of the factors that are involved in, in building alluvial rivers and the, the quantification of the parameters of the environment around them. So really quick, I'm going to walk you through a test of the idea that, in fact, we can appropriately get the sediment flux. So uh, <clears throat> this, is not, uh, this is not work from my group. Um, there's, a, there's a basic idea that, okay, if you take this cross-section of a basin and there's all this sediment that's filling in this sedimentary basin, from the downstream end, if you integrate up towards the source, uh, what you get at each point of the integral, uh, if you include geologic time, is an estimate of the rate of sediment transport past that point. So basically, at this location right here, through the amount of time that, that this basin was active at that location, all of this sediment had to be transported. And so the flux at that location is equal to the total volume of sediment that's downstream divided by geologic time. And... <clears throat> There's, there's not much fancy in there. It's really just conservation of mass. So our idea is to take this conservation of mass approach and apply it into a real basin and compare that to the fluxes that one would get from a paleohydraulic approach. So <clears throat> the uh, basin that we use is here in uh, um, Central North America in the eastern part of Wyoming. Uh, it comes from the, uh, the Cretaceous. And at that time, there was a waterway that connected the Gulf of Mexico down here up to the Arctic uh, Ocean. And uh, at the actual time of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the units being deposited, the shoreline was something like this blue line. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a nice break from onshore to offshore in the basin. And this is the uh, model for the basin that was uh, produced by um, other workers in the in the in the seventies, and so there's a fluvial section where we can apply our paleohydraulic ideas, and there's a uh, there's a, a near shore section and an offshore section, and so we can look at at all the sediment that's in here and know well the fluvial system must have transported all this sediment because it's out there it exists, and we can say so how much sediment was moved in the fluvial system using the mass conservation approach, and how much. Uh, sediment was moved through the idea that the river channels that are recorded there should be telling us how much sediment moved through them. So, so we take this section and we estimate the paleohydraulic uh, fluxes that are there and uh, we compare that to the fluxes that are required by mass conservation through the rest of the section. So, the, the hypothesis, right, is that the paleohydraulic sediment flux is equivalent to the mass conservation sediment flux, and therefore it's correlated to the longitudinal distribution of preserved bed material. So where the bed material is, is directly connected to how much sediment was moving through the fluvial section. Okay, so take our little basin out here. It is now the, uh, the Powder River Basin. These are the Bighorn Mountains. 
this is this is the outline of the state of Wyoming, and uh, Laramie is is here. Uh, so that's where uh, I uh, am coming from. And uh, uh, the points in red represent outcrop, and the yellow and blue are subsurface data. So we collected all the uh, subsurface data, uh, well logs, um, and, uh, and the outcrop data, and then we reconstructed the two methods of, of understanding sediment flux and compared them. Okay, so <clears throat> for the subsurface, um, we had lots of... Uh, uh, well logs, and so we used a gamma ray to, to give us a sense of, of how much sand there was relative to muds, and we made a sand fraction of the deposit and multiplied that by the total depths in order to get the total amount of sand. It turns out that, that there aren't any more samples out here because there's not any more sand out there. The companies stopped drilling that deep because they knew it was just mud, so the sand stopped. And this white line represents the, the trend of sediment transport um, through uh, uh, looking at the directions that the bed forms told us that sediment was moving. And so, so basically what we do is we, we take the outcrop data and the subsurface data and project all those points onto a line here and then look at this problem in, in 2D. Uh, so, so this is the, uh, the subsurface uh, data. So here's the thickness of sand and that's the, uh, the, the red squares. Um, and uh, on the right is the, uh, the, the sediment flux, which is the integral from the downstream end up towards the upstream end of the, uh, of, the, of the amount of material divided by the geologic time that that transport system was active in the basin. And so, so here's some, some, some sediment flux. There's numbers, whatever. It doesn't really matter. You know, there's, it's, 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 it's even hard for me to intuit the order of magnitude that's represented here in sediment flux. Um, so here's some nice outcrop photos and an undergraduate student who is uh, uh, helping to make measurements at the time for scale. Um, in the outcrops, we must apply the modern relationships, the modern models for sediment transport in rivers. These are the pieces of that puzzle. We don't need to go into it anymore, but we have, if I've argued appropriately to you, closed the problem, right? We have grain size and flow depth, so we can get that, we can make stresses. Then, then these are all of the modern relationships that if you were a hydraulic engineer today, you would use to understand the behavior of a river and plan for, you know, how much sediment it was going to be moving, the stability of bridge structures and, and, and whatnot. So we, we, we use those models. Uh, it, what we need are, is the, the, the dimensions of the channel and the grain sizes, and we have some assumptions here, and those assumptions are basically bankful, uh, as we talked about earlier. And then we also assume appropriately that the densities and viscosities and gravities are relative to Earth's surface. That becomes a problem for extraterrestrial settings, but hey, okay. Um, <clears throat> and so, so then uh, the outcrop data, the red points, here's the, uh, the sediment fluxes that are predicted from paleohydraulics, from the preserved deposits of those sedimentary rocks. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here they are, the two separate ones, but we put them together into a single plot. And so these red points are actually the paleohydraulic fluxes, and the blue points are the mass conservation required sediment fluxes from the, the <coughs> distal portion of the basin. And you can see that they overlap only briefly because, well, this section was the fluvial section uh, and so there wasn't complete preservation. It was at the surface, so we didn't know where all the sand was, but we could measure the outcrops and get the fluxes. And so there's only one spot where, where subsurface and the surface sort of overlap. Um, <clears throat> but, but nonetheless, I mean, you can see that, the, that the, they more or less plot and well within the, the uncertainty in the, same, in the same place. If you take and plot for, you know, this cluster of points around here and and, uh, and put it in sediment flux for mass conservation against sediment flux from the paleohydraulics, and the one-to-one -one line is the you know, uh, support of the hypothesis, so to speak, then, uh, then that, this cluster of data represents that point with this uncertainty in those two directions. So well, well 
well within what we would consider to be the, the range of uncertainty, it seems like the sediment flux that is predicted from paleohydraulics matches that which is required by sediment mass conservation in this basin. And I mean, it's it just happenstance that it even comes close to being a, the one-to-one -one line as far as I'm concerned. Like, it could easily be most of an order of magnitude away, and I would still say that it supported the hypothesis because the uncertainty that's in the modern relationships is very large. The uncertainty that were in those equations that I showed is very large relative to how the behavior of all the modern systems. I mean, you even saw that, those, that cloud of points from bankful stress against grain size. That was a big spread, like an order of magnitude spread. And so, so accepting this is, is, is really quite easy. Um, <clears throat> so I think that works. Where, where do we want to go? I'll wrap up. I got like two more slides. Uh, I think water discharge is, the, is the, the next sort of big one to really get the pieces right. Um, uh, it, as a function of channel depth and depending on the grain sizes where the grains are responsible for the resistance, uh, we, can, we can probably do quite a good job of getting uh, water discharge at least for, for terrestrial systems for now. I think there's a lot of room for us to start thinking about how uh, paleohydraulics uh, in fluvial systems can help to uh, interact with and inform uh, how we think about um, uh, paleogeographic reconstructions using other methods, in this case, you know, like detrital zircons or something like that. Um, I mean, basically, if there's some fluvial strata with zircons in it, they say, well, this clearly had to come from that other side of the continent. Well, then you have to ask the question, okay, well, was the channel feature that it came from big enough to actually have had a connection to the other side of the continent or not? I mean, that's a relatively straightforward question to ask that I think that we can figure out how to start doing. Um, and then finally, chemical sediments. And that's what brings uh, us here to the Ebro um, is the, uh, the fantastic chemical sediments that are, that are part of the uh, center of the Ebro Basin and connected to the Caspe Formation. And the idea here is that the water discharge from chemical sediment transport has to be the same water that was moving that transported the physical sediments. And so if we can understand the details of the river systems from the physical sediment transport point of view, then maybe we can get at what that must have meant for the chemical sediment transport point of view as well. And I'm pretty sure that that will have greater extraterrestrial implications than the other things, simply because uh, we need to think about those uh, systems that are very reactive, like on Mars, where there's not very much water, and so there's instantly lots of dissolution of material and reprecipitation. Okay, so a couple of conclusions here. Uh, Paleohydraulic methods use relationships from modern fluvial deltaic processes to quantitatively interpret past environmental conditions on Earth and extraterrestrial bodies. It's generally possible to make estimates of sediment flux and preserve channel bodies from grain size and straddle geometries, so flow depths and bar depths and stuff like that. Uh, this provides the most robust approach to quantifying details of ancient channelized transport systems. Um, Modern process models are the greatest source of quantifiable uncertainty for interpreting uh, conditions. And I think there's a, a whole wealth yet of information that is untapped um, from fluvial strata about their depositional conditions, and specifically that we can use to quantify um, various aspects of, of, of deep time. Okay. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take your questions.